Hello everybody, my name is Stefan and every now and then I do these tiny recordings where people explain me things, um, all things programming or software development or web development and yeah, today I have a friend with me and you see him already, in front of me is Mudit. Mudit, how are you doing? I'm good man, how are you? Well, we have uh, the century summer here with 37 degrees out there. Ridiculous. It's, it is ridiculous for, for northern central Germany. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, what will we talk about today? Today, well, we're going to talk about Emacs. And um, before we go Ooh. into that, hello, everybody. My name right. is Mother. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a developer and I work at Contentful currently uh, in uh, extremely hot Berlin. Um, I usually work with JavaScript and TypeScript. And my uh, default editor of choice for all of that and for all of my development work is Emacs. So I thought that would be a good topic for us to talk about. You know, Totally up for that. So oh. um, can you give me a little bit of explanation what Emacs is first? Oh, it's just an editor, man. It's like, <laughs> a, there's nothing, there's really like, I mean, I, I, don't, I can't go into the history mostly because I don't know most of it. And also I don't want to give you wrong information, but the way that I uh, came across it was, um, I was in this thing called the Recurse Center in New York. And um, one of the facilitators there, I saw her give this amazing talk where she live uh, coded a video game uh, at a conference um, using Emacs. And I was like, I was just blown away as to the speed at which she was getting stuff done. And um, I had a phase where, I mean, at that point, I was a Sublime Text user. Um, and I, and I deleted every editor off my system, everything. I didn't have a choice but to use Emacs. That's how I learned it, by mm. punishment, best, best thing you could ever do. Um, and yeah, so what it is, is it's a, it's a text editor. It's, um, it's, it has a certain way that it treats uh, things. So uh, files, processes, and all of these things, you can edit them in the context of something called Emacs. OK. So it is one of these editors when I get into it uh, that I don't know how, how to get out of it? So that's definitely. Oh, definitely. <laughs> definitely. 100%. All right. So and uh, for, for this short video, uh, we have the goal that uh, we want me um, to get up and running. And then we see how far we get. And yep. this is where I will just find the screen recording or screen share button, which is this one. Entire screen and Moodit will guide me through my entire screen. Yes, share. Right. Yeah, we're going to try and set up uh, Emacs. It's bare bones, it's super bare bones by default. So we're going to try and see how much we can get done, basically. And in the meantime, basically um, learn like the alphabets of Emacs and learn um, how to use Emacs to teach ourselves Emacs because you can actually do it inside of it. That's the cool part. Interesting. Do you see my screen? I do, yes. All right. So all I have to do is now I will go to my terminal, and that's what we do, right? Yes. We're going to sit in the terminal. Um, one thing. Um, yeah, actually, let's get started. Um, so let's go ahead and install Emacs. OK. First of all. So we're not going to use the one that's built in. Why not? So the one that's built in, um, it runs in the terminal. Uh, and the one that we want is we want something that's packaged as an app so that it has a GUI wrapper around it. And why is that? Well, um, if you run it inside the terminal, certain escape codes don't make it correctly to the Emacs inside of it, especially if you're using ITAM and you have to map um, escape codes um, and control characters and all of these things and combinations of things like, say, control option left. You might have to map it, which is tedious. Okay. Uh, and also, when you uh, Emacs has its own way that it does copy, paste, cut, and all of these things. Uh, and we wanted to work with the system clipboard, um, the uh, GUI wrapper around it, that version of it, it just works and it's kind of ready to go. Oh man, I'm already scared. So how, <laughs> how do I install, install it? Right. So we're going to use Homebrew because Homebrew is awesome. Yeah. Uh, so uh, let's install, let's do a uh, brew cask install Emacs. All right. Yeah, that should be fairly simple. So this should install uh, version 26.0. Two, I think. I'm not yeah. sure. Um, I'm still running 26.1, but it should be fine. Also, yeah, I'm going to be setting up my Emacs with you. So this should be fun. So we're battle tested here. So how long are oh, you yeah. using Emacs now in total? Uh, it's been four years. Only Emacs, nothing else? Yeah, nothing else. I use Emacs for <laughs> This, OK, so this is the typical thing that people say about Emacs, right? Like, it's a good operating system, with, but a shitty text editor. 
<laughs> I've never heard this. <laughs> okay. It is like I mean it it, it it's it's obviously hyperbole, but um, it, it's I, it's really really extendable, and you can use it for everything. So I do my to do list management in there. Uh, my configs for a lot of different things are there inside using this thing called org mode. Uh, uh, whenever I have to use Git, a lot of the times, uh, at least nowadays, I'm switching completely from my terminal to within Emacs using uh, Magit, which is like a killer app for it as well. Um, so yeah, I find myself living in Emacs all the time. OK, interesting. Mm -hmm. and, and is Emacs something that is also installed on remote servers when I'm, for example, SSHing somewhere in? Or how is that? Yeah, so I don't think it's one of the uh, editors that's installed by default. I think some flavors of Linux have it. But the cool part is, and if we get to it, uh, the cool part is you don't need Emacs on another server. Emacs can run as a server. So um, you can actually connect to a file over SSH from within Emacs. And then your local Emacs is your editor for the file. Can you repeat that? I'm not sure if I got that. Right. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a bit heavy. So uh, Emacs um, has, uh, it, it has a server and client module, actually, which a lot of people don't use for some reason. Even folks that uh, do use Emacs um, have been using Emacs for a while. So Emacs can be run in something called daemon mode. And what that does is it starts off Emacs as a server. And then you okay. can connect to that server. So you can have a server running locally, and you can connect to that as a client, Whee. right? So potentially, you could either run this server inside of your box that's in, on the cloud, or what you would find yourself doing instead, and what I find myself doing instead either, is I just open Emacs locally. Uh, and um, I, Emacs, you can open files using different protocols. You know, one of them is SSH. So I can connect to a box over SSH from within Emacs and just open files locally. And when, I save, it, when I save it, all the operations are remote. That sounds very powerful it is it is extremely powerful and like it's it's uh, one of these things that um, people were really excited about inside of vs code that uh, it got released some of these capabilities are in vs code now um emacs yeah. has had this for i don't know 20 odd years these terminal people right yeah i mean they thought i mean it was a much simpler time right back then they didn't have to worry about 30 levels of abstraction and yeah. they came up with good abstractions back then okay yeah that makes sense so we're almost through here okay yeah. It's taking a bit of time. Cool. Yeah, no um, while that happens, uh, let me see. Um, I'm going to open uh, my Emacs up as well locally uh, so that we are on the same page. Ooh. Window management. No. Oh. Right. Cool. So you're there. I'm not it's, there yet. Come on, homebrew. Yeah, I mean, I have it installed, so I'm kind of cheating. <laughs> That's all right. Yeah. But, but you're saying that you're using Emacs for really all things JavaScript too? Oh, yeah. So um, I use it for JavaScript, TypeScript, um, Elixir when I play with it, Erlang when I play with it, uh, Haskell definitely. Uh, and like I said, for all my to-do management and all of these things. OK, let's yeah. see. So we're there. What should I do with it? Lovely. Let's just uh, type Emacs, and you should be ready to go. Actually, wait one second. Uh, oh my yeah. god, it starts already our terminal journey. What should yeah. I do here? <laughs> yeah, so what, what's happened is it's running the built-in Emacs, right? Mm. The way like terminals hash your command and it's running, uh, it's it's not running what we just installed. So the yeah. good thing is we learn how to uh, we learn how to exit it. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> right. Where is exit? Um, it's, it's right up there. It says exit Emacs. It says CXCC. The capital C stands for control. So you keep control pressed and you go control X control C. Bam. Two commands to exit. Uh, it's not two commands. It's uh, it's it's, it's a key chord. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's a Okay. Yeah. So let's just, let's just run which Emacs to see uh, where is it picking it up from. I think it, yeah. yeah, it's taking the local one. So uh, let's run hash space Emacs, which will remove the hashed entry. And it'll, um, yeah, cool. I, I didn't know this. What is so that? what happens is when you type uh, commands in your terminal, um, to avoid having to look up on the whole path, like follow the path and find the command every time, uh, if you give, it, it basically hashes it. Right, so uh, it it basically builds a dictionary, so it doesn't have to do the full lookup. It knows exactly where the uh, command is, and it keys it by the name of the command. When yeah. you hash it, it deletes that entry and it does a relookup. 
You're still getting use of in Emacs? Okay, cool. Uh, let's, uh, uh, can you use Spotlight and start off Emacs? What do you mean with Spotlight? Oh, with Alfred, sorry, if you just, uh, it's, it's a dot app, right? So if you type Emacs, there we go. Ah, no, I see. Mm -hmm. I see what we just did. Yeah, I think the linking inside of the terminal, we'll have to do it separately. Um, and that's something we can do at another time. Okay. Cool. Um, so welcome to the splash screen. The wonderful, wonderful splash screen. This is Emacs? Yeah. <laughs> that's all it is. That's all. We're done here. Let's all go home. <laughs> okay. Oh, I lost the controls. Okay. Right. So um, if you, uh, so let's, I mean, see if you can move around in there. Things work. The arrow keys clicking. Do all the things yeah. work for you? Yeah. Are you able to select things? Oh, I can use my mouse in Emacs? Yeah, yeah. So the, the, GUI, the GUI wrapper, you can use basically all the different input methods that are not available inside of a terminal. Okay. Right? Uh, which is which is why which is one of the big reasons um, that I would suggest anybody you start off use it because a lot of the things that you're used to uh, like clicking around to copy things you can do all of that command mm -hmm. C command V all of these things work you don't have to use built-in Emacs commands right okay. cool yeah. so uh, let's uh, let's start off by mm, right so I'm just gonna have a look at actually let's let's just talk about this this whole GUI that you're seeing how about that yeah. Make yeah. it a bit more familiar, yeah. So, so what you what we would traditionally or in contemporary GUI applications call a window, uh, in Emacs world is called a frame, right? So this is one frame here right now. This is one singular frame. You can spin off multiple ones if you want. Or every time you open the Emacs app, it's going to start a new frame, okay. right? Now, frame inside of the frame. Yeah, just deny. It's fine. Yeah, we'll find out if that causes problems later on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right. So inside of the frame, um, we see multiple things here. So we see the toolbar up top, which kind of looks old school with all these icons, right? It yeah. looks very Notepad++. Yeah. yeah. Right. And then uh, let's skip the big white section where we can, which is the main buffer area. And let's talk about the things that are below that. So there's this gray line that says GNU Emacs, yeah. right? That's your mode line. It's equivalent. So you're a VS Code user, yes? Mainly, yeah. Cool. So in VS Code, also at the bottom of VS Code, it gives you like status of things and it tells you like prettier is enabled, language mode and all of that, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah this is that same line. Okay. And it gives you a bunch of information about the, the current context that you're in. And then there is another space below that. Yeah. Right? We're, we're you nothing. Can't yeah, you can't click any, you can't click there and it looks like it's nothing, but that's actually cool. a pretty, yeah, leave that window open. We'll figure out how to close it. Don't worry. Um, yeah, you can just click around to move around, but it mm -hmm. won't let you close it without knowing a key binding. OK. Right? Um, so that, that uh, area below, whenever you do something, it, sh it, like, give, it prints a message. Like, just select something. Yeah. 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 And it says, like, you're doing some stuff there, right? So that's yeah. called the mini buffer. Where, uh, <laughs> OK. Yeah. So, so the concept, so, so the one beautiful thing, at least for me personally, about Emacs is, uh, it's, it's kind of unix -y in the sense, um, in Unix, everything is a file, quote. Yeah. I, I know, not really, but that, the way that things are simplified in Unix is that everything is a file, right? Yeah. The way that I, you could simplify this, similarly, you can simplify things in Emacs saying everything's a buffer. OK. Right? Now, um, what that actually means is a buffer is a representation of something that uh, you're using within Emacs. That might be a file. Yeah. That might be a process. Yeah. Uh, that might be a shell, which also is in a way a process, right? Yeah. yeah. So, so what you're looking at right now in front of you, these white sections, these are called windows. And the way that I understand this is a window is a way you look into a buffer. OK. So, so not like a re representation of the buffer or a way to just peek into it. Exactly. So this is, uh, this is what lets you interact with the buffer. Mm -hmm. Right, buffer is a, is 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 basically a massive data structure with a bunch of operations on it. Okay, and this lets you uh, interact with that buffer. And not all buffers are the same, mm. in the sense that uh, they, there is a root abstraction of a buffer, and then you can build on top of it. Right. Okay. And um, so, with that in mind, these white things that we are seeing now, you have two windows, right? Yeah. Yeah. And we can see that the cursor is in the left window. Yeah. Cool. So let's get rid of the window on the right. And the way that we're going to do that is we're going to stay in the window on the left. Right. And uh, conceptually, in VS Code, for example, you could maximize a split. Right. Yeah. We do the same thing here. And the way that you do that is Control X 
one. Not control X, control one, control X, and then one. Mm -hmm. There you go. Bam. So uh, all your Windows commands, like uh, dealing with splitting windows and setting all of that up, they're usually control X followed by a number, right? And the number so, matches to an index of the window? Uh, no. The number, uh, at least to me, feels fairly arbitrary. OK. So yeah. how did you know that it was 1? Control X 1 will always make uh, the window where your cursor is 100%. Ah. Well, let's do the opposite of it. If you, uh, um, so uh, if you click on the thing again and open the other buffer on the right side, yeah. let's go on the buffer on the right. Um, how do you think we can make the zero? Oh wait, I I, I lost yeah. my main window now. No, no worries, <laughs> no worries. So let's open. A, let, let's do, uh, let's uh, look into another command, right? So we were talking about everything being a buffer, and we said that not every buffer is visible, right? Yeah. What we are working with are the windows on top. So let's look at all the buffers that you have open currently, uh, yeah. which are not visible, and some of which which are visible. So the command for that is C X. So Control X, Control B, where B stands for buffer. Control X, Control B. Right, so on the right, you see the different buffers that are open, some of which you haven't even seen, right? There's some, if you see, there's one there called a scratch buffer, yeah. which has always been there, but we never really saw it. Okay. Right, and the one that we were looking at before that was the GNU Emacs, the, the splash screen was that buffer. Right. What was that? Right. Control C, con no, Control X, Control B. No. Yeah, Control X, Control B will show you all the buffers. Uh, yeah, there we go. So and this um, is where, where this joke with the operating system comes from, because it already feels like I'm running here, I'm looking into my Mac process, whatever thing. Yeah, yeah, I, I guess, I don't know. I mean, in a way, maybe, in a way, maybe, yeah. But um, all it all really is, is the list of open um, buffers that you have in your current Emacs process. Okay. All the buffers that it's tracking. Right, so uh, what we were gonna look into is, we saw that Control X1, would make a window 100% of the size of the frame, right? Yeah. Uh, what do you think is the way to make it zero, so minimize? Well, I go with zero. Yeah, try it. Control X, zero. Okay. Bam. Right? So this part makes sense. Okay, how about you bring back that uh, uh, window again? <laughs> uh, it was Control X, Control B. Here we go. Yep. Right, and let's go into this. So in this window, there's this little word on top that says mode, right? Yeah. Right, so let's uh, click on the scratch buffer, or let's go into the scratch. If you uh, go on any one of those and press enter, it should um, take you to it. Lovely. So, um, and let's maximize this. Control X1. Okay. Perfect, perfect. So this is one of, um, I, I think Emacs is the only editor that I know that does this by default. Um, you get like a, a scratch pad whenever you open an instance of Emacs. You can keep doing whatever in here, uh, yeah. and it won't save it. It's a scratch buffer, right? You can discard it. OK. Right? And also, uh, uh, what this leads us into is um, the concept of modes. And I'm going to try and draw parallels between VS Code and Emacs where I can. OK. Yeah? So in um, uh, VS Code, for example, if you're editing a stylus file, yep. you need to install an extension that adds support for the stylus um, syntax and all the different uh, capabilities that should come with the stylus file, yes? Yeah. So Emacs has the same uh, um, core concept. Um, it's, it has this concept of modes. Mm -hmm. uh, a mode is basically how... Um, uh, it's it's what imparts editing capabilities um, or what defines the uh, editing characteristics of a buffer. So okay. what that means, what that means, let's look into the one that you have here right now. Uh, if you look at the mode line, do you remember the mode line? Yeah. So it says Lisp, Interaction, and LDOC. Yeah. So what that stands for is the first one over there, Lisp, is the major mode. OK. Yeah. So the major mode basically uh, determines the editing behavior of Emacs. OK. Right? Uh, for that buffer that's open, that current buffer. So the major mode for this is Lisp, which is Emacs Lisp by default. Emacs, oh, by the way, Emacs um, uh, is written uh, mostly in C and uh, Emacs Lisp, Elisp. Um, mm -hmm. 
Uh, and also, so because of that, um, it you can treat it as a massive ELIS uh, repo, so to speak. Okay. And the way that you would do that is you would open any file. So for example, we are in the scratch buffer and you uh, enable the Lisp mode and automatically um, it treats everything in this file as Emacs Lisp. Okay. So it's equivalent to enabling the stylus buffer when you're in a stylus file, uh, stylus mode when you're in a stylus file. Yeah, okay, right? that makes sense. So, yeah. so, so uh, and the things after that, they're called minor modes. Now minor modes are additive to the behavior that is imparted by the major mode. So they can add capabilities. So you can have a minor mode that does linting, for example. Mm. Right? And, I, and there, there could be several in there then, yeah? Or you could have many, but you can have only one major mode by design. Yeah. But obviously, obviously, users have uh, written uh, modes which let you combine multiple major modes. It's kind of tricky, yeah. but it makes sense because say you're editing an HTML file that has CSS, HTML, and JavaScript, yeah. you need multiple modes within the context of a single buffer, right? Yeah. yeah so you that can do sense. that. It is possible. Uh, yeah. But mostly, uh, you'll see folks use one major mode at once. Yeah. Right? So um, let's, let's uh, get into the fact or let's get into my favorite part about Emacs, the fact that you can modify everything about it on the fly. OK, what does right? that mean? What does that mean? So we're going to be, <laughs> write, we're gonna be writing some uh, tiny bits of uh, Emacs list to uh, update the behavior. or the. So let's start with look and feel. Yeah, It looks kind of yeah. ugly right now, correct? Do you think so? Uh, I mean, let's, get, let's see. Uh, <laughs> do you, do you, do you, would you want that toolbar up top there? Well, I feel a little bit retro, but I can. I, I would say I could live without it. <laughs> yeah. So let's let's uh, so let's write some elist to get rid of it. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So if you open parentheses like uh, like a normal list, and inside of that, let's say uh, menu hyphen bar hyphen mode menu. Uh, dash uh, dash bar mode yeah space minus one. I've never written Lisp or anything, so. Yeah, so the menu bar mode is a function, and we are passing it the argument minus one. OK. Right? Uh, I'm just going to confirm that that is the actual command. I can never remember these, because uh, there are so many of them. But we're going to look into, actually, this is the perfect time to use Emacs to teach us a bit of Emacs. Okay. Do you want to try that? OK, yeah, cool. Of course I want so, to. Lovely. So le we're going to, so Emacs has a a lot of documentation inside of it. You can look for anything. It's very, very introspectable, right? OK, so how, how do I get into documentation? Exactly. So we do Control H, A. Control H, A. So it's asking us to search for a word list or reg reg ugh, regular expression. Yeah. Uh, and let's just type in menu bar mode. And it's giving us, so if you move to that buffer, and if you just go on the first entry or any entry and hit Enter, it will show you the documentation for it. So the documentation. Ooh, left, right, left, right. OK. Ooh, yeah, I okay. keep switching things around. Many bars but all of these are temporary buffers. If you press Q in any one of them, it will close. Just Q? Yeah. Interesting. And if you do the same thing here, it's going to close. OK. What was the command? Control H. Control H. All com oh, so all commands that uh, start with Control H are for help. Mm -hmm. Right. And so if you I... start, yeah. So if you start with Control H and read what's in the mini buffer, like this here. No, if you can see, it says type question mark for further options. It'll show you all the prefixes, uh, all the suffixes you can use after. We used A, which is the first one. Uh... Okay. So right? what we did was Control H and A, and this was then menu bar. You don't even need to type the full thing. Like it's going to do a massive search. Okay. Right. Cool. In so, interesting. Okay. Uh, so we're going to be using this uh, way of looking through things uh, a good amount to basically have Emacs teach itself to us. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. So let's get back that into a scratch and make it pretty. How how do I? Press Q. Q, and I can get rid of this one. OK. Cool. So now we have uh, uh, um, a bit of code here that we want to execute. Mm -hmm. right? Now we said that Emacs basically understands Elisp, so we can run thing inside of it. So let's evaluate that expression. You don't have to select it. Okay. Let's go to the end of the line, right? 
Yeah. So everything behind it is one S expression, right? It's one node, and we can execute this node. So the way you execute it is Control X, Control E. Control X, Control E. Did anything happen? Nothing, nothing happened. Okay, cool. So now I need to open Scratch mode for myself <laughs> and see what. <laughs> uh, it, it said nil in the last line. I did say nil, didn't it? Yeah. I think I gave you the wrong command. Uh, give me one quick second. Um, this is always the uh, part that um, I lose track of uh, with respect to all the different things you can run to uh, make things appear and disappear. So let me. But couldn't see. I just search for it? So control A. Exactly. A. Mm -hmm. And menu bar. We want to hide it, right? Yeah, and the way that we want to do it is, remember I was saying everything about Emacs is basically a mode. Mm. The menu bar itself is displayed by a mode. So what we want to do is we want to disable it. That's okay, what the so minus one does. Menu bar. Is it TMM menu bar? No. Uh, give me one second. I'm going to look it up as well. Da -da -da. Right. Um, hmm. So that didn't work, did it? Nope. That's all right. Uh, let's try something else. Let's leave this one out for now. Um, so. Uh, if you remember your tweet, which had to do with uh, being able to move around in the terminal. Yep. yep. Right? Let's try some of those commands. So uh, see, uh, like go to any line. And uh, do you remember how you go to the beginning and the end of the line from your tweet? Control A, Control E. Yeah. And that is all that I remember already. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's actually good enough. So you have Control A, Control E, and Control back, uh, meta back and meta forward should take you word by word. It just did, right? Control, mm, Control, met option. OK. Uh, yeah. Option, yeah. Option uh, back and forward, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, you can also, uh, so Emacs also has this concept, uh, concept of um, expressions, right? As expressions, different modes can define what an expression is. So in JavaScript, for example, it defines uh, different things that uh, make up an expression. So parentheses could make up an expression. Uh, square brackets could as well. So let's write something. Write something in parentheses uh, inside of it as much as you want, right? And then open another set of parentheses inside of it and put something in there as well. OK, cool. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Uh, let's go. Uh, so from where you are, uh, we're going to try moving in terms of structure, yeah? Mm -hmm. So let's try um, uh, Control Option B, which is back. You notice it goes to the matching parentheses on the other end. Mm. If you do Control Option F, it's going to go back to the matching parentheses on the other end from any parentheses, yeah. Does that work in my terminal too? A lot of these actually do work in your terminal. The parentheses one, I'm not so sure. I've never really used it. But it, uh, it depends on, I think the terminal won't interpret the combination of your control keys and the characters properly. Control, what was it, B? No. Control, control meta uh, B yeah. and control meta F. Yeah, it didn't work. Yeah, yeah. It's, it, this is, that's the tricky part, because like, you have to do mapping of all these um, control sequences properly. Like, if I do it on mine, I get like a carrot five or something like that. It's weird. OK, yeah. Cool. So we are able to move around. Um, we are able to, um, let's see if we can actually execute some small bit of code in here. Let's like write a function to, uh, let's just add two numbers, like one and two. OK. Right? Uh, so plus, and then, uh, yeah, uh, it's, all, uh, it's, it's a Lisp, so it's all prefix. So it'll What's be plus. It? one and then, like you give the function first and then you give the argument uh, oh i'm learning lisp on the same way here yeah and if you do control x control e at the end of it you see the result in the bottom mini buffer interesting right 
So how, how could I now write this to disk? Right now we're just in a scratch pad, right? Yeah. So let's. Uh, I mean, I wouldn't suggest saving um, the scratch file, but if you wanted to, let's. Uh, this, the command to save a buffer is Control X. That's your prefix command. Yeah, Control X, mm -hmm. and then save is Control S. Mm. I like that you straight up made that a dot file. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Right. If you notice, something's happened inside of our file. Wait, I just have to see that it really worked. Okay. I'm right. writing files with Emacs. <laughs> biome, biome. But something, something tricky has happened. Uh, since you provided an extension, it inferred a different mode and has changed it to text mode. Ooh. So what we're going to do right now is we're going to drop it back into the Lisp mode. Can I try something first? Yeah, go for it. Uh, no change. Ah, oh, smart thing. Okay, so X Y. So I want to save it. Ah, now it's say. Ah, it's just saving. Ah, okay. Yeah. How can I give it a new name? The file. You want to rename it? Mm-hmm. Uh, so this is the this is the point. Yeah. So I was gonna jump into um a, the concept of uh you know like VS Code has this command palette kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Command Shift P, I believe. Um, yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, so Emacs has that as well. Uh, it has a bunch of built-in commands that you can invoke to do things, one of which is renaming a file. Yep. Uh, and the way you invoke that is option X. Option X. So that's where the mini buffer becomes interesting. You see it's prompting you for a command. And it, mm -hmm. you, can, you can tab complete. And keep it in tab and it'll tell you, yeah, bam. So now you give it the file that you want to rename. You can again tab complete. No, just hit enter after it. Rename uh, it. Yeah. Okay. And now, right? okay, but it doesn't know. It doesn't have a JavaScript mode. So that's why it didn't flip. Oh, you mean the uh, uh, list mode? Yeah, yeah. This this main major mode here. Yeah. So we're gonna we're gonna switch it manually into that because we can. Okay. Right, so it's the same thing. Meta uh, uh, option X, which is meta X, mm -hmm. and you can just start typing Emacs, and should show you uh, one of those modes. Emacs Lisp mode, like this. Yeah, and it's enabled. And if you try and execute that thing again, it should work. What was execution again? Uh, so Control E. The E stands for execution. So you do control X, which was a prefix command, like you remember. Mm -hmm. And control X followed by control E. And that worked yeah. down there. Right? So let's try printing something in there. OK. So we're going to use a function called, uh, so the, the little uh, bar down there to write something there, we use a function called message. I don't understand what you just said. So, the, so like how we said plus was a function? Yeah, exactly. Exactly like that. Okay. And then give, give it a string as a parameter. Strings are in double quotes. Mm -hmm. Like this? Yeah. Executed. So control X, control E. Mm -hmm. Sweet. And bam. So, so now everything starts with control X, is that right? Not everything, um, but a lot of uh, the commands uh, start with control X. But obviously, since this is a completely hackable editor, you can modify everything on the fly. Of course. Right? Uh, yeah. Let's look into the help uh, thing again to see what are the different things that are available to us, right? So um, we can do control H, M, which will give you all the help for the current mode. Mm -hmm. so on the, you can see the different shortcuts that are available to you and the different modes that you're running. So it says Emacs, uh, Emacs Lisp is the major mode, and then you have all those minor modes enabled. Right? W wait, what, what minor modes? No, you so, lost me a little bit. Yeah, sorry. If you see the first line. Ah, here. OK. Yeah. It says it's enabled all these modes. And anything that's blue is a hyperlink. So if you hit Enter, it'll take you to that mode and the mm -hmm. documentation about it. So and when we. These minor modes are basically when I'm now in here, I could get some auto completion or something. And yeah. Stuff. Yeah. So we could enable auto, uh, auto completion as a minor mode, which is which it is. Um, mm -hmm. We could enable that, and then you would have auto completion suddenly, just just like that. 
Okay, and it is a minor mode because the major mode defines, for example, the programming language or the environment this buffer mm -hmm. runs in. Did mm -hmm. I get that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it defines okay. the, the, the core characteristics of what it is you're editing. Okay. And then the autocomplete can adapt based on that. Makes sense. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the, the coolest part is like we do this every day as developers, right? We think about composition and function yeah, composition. Yeah. That's all yeah. that we're doing with modes. We're composing modes together to have to, to modify the editor in such a way that it fits our purposes and our way of thinking. Okay. Right? Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, that's where the big power for, of Emacs comes from. Okay. Cool. So um, let's uh, set up uh, some, uh, let's set up four convenience key bindings. So um, actually, before that, uh, let's uh, make another file. How about you save this one? Mm. Control X, Control Save. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Man, you, I'm getting that. Yeah, and if you ever forget it, we can check what key bindings uh, do. So uh, again, let's do Control H and then K. So it's asking you to put in a key chord. So if you put in Control X, Control S, just uh, press the key combination. It tells you what it uh... what it wants. Interesting. Right? So it's, what I was saying earlier was it's completely introspectable. You can see how everything's connected. OK. How, how, did you, how did you learn all these commands? Or is there, there a certain set that I, I mean, we now had, I don't know, six, seven, eight different commands. Did, did mm -hmm. you have a piece of paper no. in the beginning? Or how did you do it? Um, I mean, in the beginning, it was um, exactly how I'm telling you, which is I learned how to find help, basically. Mm -hmm. And every time um, I would forget a command. So the, th the magical thing about the control H thing is you can type it in any context. So for example, uh, if you exit this, if you press Q on this, yeah. type just control X and then control H. What do you mean by just here and here? No, it's like uh, press the key card control X and then control H. Okay, control X, control H. Uh, you did control C, control X. Okay, wait. <laughs> control X, control H. Here it go. tells you all the things, all the commands that start with control X. Oh, okay. Let me just have a look in here. <laughs> yeah, so it has a lot. And you don't have to know all of these, obviously. But if you look through this, you're going to find the command that we use, which was control C, con uh, control X, control S to save, control X, control B. That's right up there, list buffers. Um, all of these commands that we have gone through are there. So the way that I learned it was I would remember parts of the command and then I would put control H after it and then Emacs would tell me, um, okay, maybe you want to use one of these. Yeah. yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Press type. Oh, no, just exit this as in, um, yeah, you don't want to enable this because it's weird. Type, no. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Interesting. Okay. Right. So we haven't done one thing yet, which is uh, we haven't um, opened a file yet. Like we haven't visited a file. Yeah. yeah. So let's visit a file. Um, assuming that it starts with Control X, how do you think you would get well, to? Well, I'm already file? here. <laughs> so I will now have a look. How, how do I search in this buffer? Control. Oh yeah. So this is something that you do inside your terminal as well. Uh, you there's this thing called I search that people use inside the terminal. Yes. I search no. Yeah. I so search? just uh, press Control S. Control S. And start typing. Ah, I'm using I. Ah, I'm using this buddy here. Mm. Interesting. Right. Um, this yeah. actually is the default command inside Emacs as well. You press Control S. That's how you search. Okay. Control S. And, and I th open. You. Uh, it's called find file. You want to do find hyphen file, find dash file. Okay, and navigate press, now. Control S. Keep pressing Control S. Okay, got it. Mm -hmm. Find file. Yeah, and if you want to go backwards, it's Control R, but there's your command. S, Control R. Find file. Which was. Okay, so Control X, Control F, 
find file and now um, we could go projects stefan mm -hmm. is in there that is nice that it's terminal like inside of here that's actually cool right yeah it makes it pretty snappy yeah that's cool so it's figured like out a real you... developer now <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I just saw uh, Gary Bernhardt's talk about uh, ideologies, which talks about this whole concept of real developers and, oh man, that term. Whoa, that <laughs> yeah, <that's>, uh... <laughs> uh, right. Uh, cool. So you open the JSON file, it's figured out it's some sort of JavaScript thing, and it's enabled the JavaScript mode for you. Cool. Right? So let's try uh, some commands that we used in the previous file. So if you go to any brace, any bracket, for example, or any string quote, uh, yeah. We did, uh, to move backwards and forward, uh, we it did... was B and F, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, uh, wait, wait, wait. Uh, how do, uh, is Control Z a thing? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you can do, uh, so undo is, uh, you can either do Command Z, which is the default thing, right? Yeah. Or the Emacs thing would be Control and forward slash. Control, forward slash. Yeah, no, I'm sticking with Command Z. Yeah. yeah. So... And going to the other curlies would now option. Control option back. Control option. B. Yeah, so you need to do it from uh, one, uh, ca uh, one character ahead of the, yeah, from there. There nice. we go. So it's control option or just option. Control option. No, now you do it from, so the opening bracket, it's on the bracket with the closing one, it's after it. <laughs> I, I, yeah, it's, I can tell you why later, but um, yeah, there you go. And it'll work with even like strings, for example. Nice, that's cool. Yeah, so one of my favorite things in Emacs, which uh, I didn't see in any other editor when I started using Emacs, which blew my mind was, if you go to the beginning of the quote, like the opening quote for a string, Right? Mm. And say I want to select the whole string that's in there. Yeah. Um, the way that you would usually do this is uh, you wouldn't do it in terms of structure. Even in VS Code, you would use shift with, say, like option to select a word. Right? Yeah, I would go yeah. something like this. Yeah. yeah, which is weird, right? So let's try and select based on structure, which is by default supported. So the way that you do that is you do uh, control option space. Control option. Or you have it bound to, uh, your, yeah, you might want to unbind that from uh, Fantastical or Kill Fantastical. <laughs> kill processes. Yeah, I had the same thing when I set up Fantastical. OK, so what was the control option space? Mm -hmm. And keep pressing it. Ooh. It's pretty Ooh. cool, right? Ooh. Yeah. Am I now in a fancy mode, or what is going on? No, it's, this is just pure default built-in Emacs. This works in any, um, any uh, major mode. All major modes support this sort of selection. OK, so how, how do I get rid of the selection? That's exactly. Right. So the magical thing that everybody needs to learn at one point in Emacs is how do I quit the command that I'm running? Right? It's Control-G. Just start spamming Control-G, and it'll quit it. It says quit in the mini buffer, if you notice. Interesting. Right. So if you start off any sort of a thing, you press Control G and it quits it. That's cool. Right? Yeah, nice. And um, so this is default capability. Obviously, there are much more powerful packages that let you do a lot of different kinds of structural editing and selections based on this capability. OK. Right? Uh, which yeah. makes, which, yeah, at the end of the day, we write code, and it can, actually, it can make us really, really fast because we can move much faster when it comes to editing text. Cool. Yeah, right? that, that's cool. Yeah, that, that is very nice. Right. OK, cool. Now, uh, let's do uh, one more thing, and maybe we check in on the time after that. Uh, this is my other favorite uh, thing. Are you looking at the same buffer, and you're typing, and it's showing you things on both sides? Um, <laughs> I love that. I love that. Fancy. It's all such a simple abstraction at the core of it, right? But I was, it, actually, I, w I wanted to close this one on the right side. But how do I close uh -huh. it now? So if you remember, uh, if you close it, it'll close both of them. What you want to actually do is just close that window, yes? Mm -hmm. So oh, uh, then I would go Control X1. Bam. <laughs> Bam. Yes. Nice. Yes. This makes me so happy. <laughs> uh, 
cool. So let's look into uh, like copying, pasting, and editing. Uh, copying, okay. pasting, and cutting. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So this is this is one of my most favorite things, uh, and this I'm fanboying out hard because I wish every operating system had this, but it does not, and an editor has this. So um, the way uh, copying, cutting, and pasting work in Emacs is it keeps its own. Um, it maintains a data structure, which is basically a circular queue. Mm -hmm. And whenever you copy something, it puts it on the circular queue or a ring buffer, basically. Right? It keeps putting things there. So let's try okay. it. Like, let's try it, and then we talk about different parts of it. So how about you select a string and copy it, any string? <sighs> Control, option, space. Um, so let's copy it. The copy would be, uh, so command C would work, for example. Yeah. Right, and if you uh, let's also go somewhere else and copy another string. Copy, yeah. Right now, uh, uh, let's paste it somewhere at the bottom. Yeah, bam. Now it's pasted that string. Now say that you actually want to use the first thing you copied. Right. Yeah. yeah. So if you paste it, uh, let's let's uh, make a small change. You were pasting it with command V, yes. Correct. So do that. Go for it. And then press meta Y, the letter Y. Did anything happen? Nope. Exactly. So, uh, command C. <laughs> yeah, I, I wanted to. Yeah, me? I, wanted, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so when we use command C, command V, we are actually interacting with uh, the Mac. system clipboard. Yeah. Uh, which serves its purpose. But uh, I would suggest uh, looking at uh, interacting with uh, the Emacs. Um, Clipboard. It's not really a clipboard, but let's call it a clipboard. Uh, and it internally uh, works with your system clipboard, so okay. you don't have to worry about it. So the way that you do that is: um, uh, Have you used uh, Vim before? I think you have, if I remember correctly. Yeah, yeah. So it has the same thing called killing and yanking. Oh, I was not that far into Vim, but yeah. So the way that you cut when you cut something, it's called killing it. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, when you cut it, it's called killing. When you uh, copy it, uh, it's called killing save, and we'll go into that in a second. And when you paste it, it's called yank, which means you pull it out of the buffer that you have and stick it back in the document. Okay. Right? So let's do a copy first. The way that you do a copy is meta W, which is the default key binding. Okay. Cool. It's copied. Now let's go. Uh, let's go and copy another string from any anywhere else. Bam. And let's go paste. Uh, Let's go down. And the way we paste is with control. And uh, to paste is yank. So it starts with a Y. So control Y. Nothing. OK, now press meta Y. No? Wait, I'm pressing the Y. OK, let's try copying again for a second. OK. Just can I see a... what is in my clipboard, by the way, or in this ring? You can, yes. Uh, you definitely can. Uh, what is the command, though? I have no idea. <laughs> okay, so command W. Uh, meta W. Uh, option W. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Got this. Option W. Mm -hmm. And to paste, it's Control Y. Y. Can't say Y properly. Bam. And now press Meta Y or Option Y. It keeps. So you keep going through all the things you've copied. Interesting. Wait, let me play around with this. Yeah, copy as many things as you want. Play around. I'm going to look up how to find the kill ring. Kill. kill ring. <laughs> copy as many things you want, man. I'm learning copy and pasting <laughs> on a computer. No, but like it's, it's, it's so much more powerful because now you don't have to copy one thing. And then when you copy another, it's destructive. It's not. It's all copies. Any kind of action is additive in this kill ring. Interesting. So, I, but I always have to start with Control Y and then uh, Option Y. Is that correct? Yeah. Or so, meta? Uh, meta Y basically toggles through the kill ring, and you mm. can use it only when the previous command was a paste. Yeah, that makes sense. Right. Otherwise, it loses context. It's like I don't really know what you're trying to cycle through. That's pretty far away from a keyboard perspective. To do you have to uh, do you have to have to have this remapped somewhere else? Uh, yeah, so I was going to talk about that at the end, but now is uh, a good time as any other. Uh, I would suggest remapping caps lock to control. Caps lock. 
Yes, but um, my point is more like the um, like the Y is in the middle of the keyboard for pasting. It's like I have to. Yeah, but that's just a habit because uh, V is just cl uh, closer. Yeah, I mean, uh, you can rebind it if you want to. We can rebind things now, or um, oh no, yeah. yeah. So, so we looked at copy and paste, and we looked at rotating through what are all the things you've copied. Yes. Mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, let's do a cut. We haven't done that yet. Okay. So if you select something and select the whole scripts block, the the brackets as well. Yeah. Now, cut is Control W. W. Yep. And now you can paste it wherever you want. And now true meta Y again, it gets us still there. Exactly. That is actually pretty cool. Right? Yeah, that is and, really cool. And one thing is we can use this um, with uh, in, in combination with the undo system inside of uh, um, Emacs mm -hmm. to do some to basically correct mistakes with respect to say you you cycle way too forward and you want to go backwards in your cycle. Mm. All you really have to do is keep undoing, and it keeps going backwards. And the way that what, you undo, what was the undo? It was control forward slash. Control. There you go. I see where the power is coming from here. Right. Yeah. 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 That's sweet. All right. Cool. I copy cool. and paste it in Emacs. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, to be honest, like, yeah, people, uh, tell me this, though, like, was it challenging in the sense that, like, it scares people? Was it scary? Well, I think it is scary because I'm usually used to, I mean, everybody can work with VS Code on day one, more or less, right? Mm -hmm. You open mm -hmm. a file and that's it. Um, in this kind of environment, it is definitely tougher because you <laughs> have to learn things. Mm -hmm. um, I tried to learn these kind of things for, for two times already, but I'm now close again with you here to um, get into the next system. So I definitely see the benefit. Nice, nice, yeah. That's actually, that's, that's, I think that's like the reaction that I've heard from um, a lot of the people where when they come into looking at a tool that's this old, um, they feel like they usually get um, scared by the fact that oh um, it's like a it's usually keyboard based right because back then main input it was like teletype terminals so it was basically all keyboards you didn't have point and click that much until Xerox came up with it at some point yeah. um, but what I've what I've seen people tell me over time is initially they're like yeah it was a bit challenging I got stuck here and there and then they like learned this world of control H right. And then they're like, yeah, every time I got stuck, I just started pressing control H for things. And it, it just kind of told me what to do. And after that initial, like maybe first few weeks, their productivity just started uh, rising. Yeah, th this is kind of what holds me back a little bit, right? When you're a software developer and you now switch into Emacs, your productivity drops. Yeah, definitely. Like... definitely. And um, I do think that getting all in is probably the best approach because when you now switch between two, two worlds, mm -hmm. um, it just drives you nuts, I would say. I would I say, guess, yeah. yeah, I would say that uh, it, it's tricky uh, because we have to get stuff done for a day job, right? So I totally understand. Um, and my suggestion would be you give in. Uh, but obviously, uh, since we have to get stuff done as well, um, I would say even a 40 to 60 balance. So what I mean by that is the, the more simpler parts of your day, do it inside of Emacs, the more challenging things for which you need like a proper tool chain for things that you're used to, um, do it inside of your whatever editor. And then whenever you have time, start moving chunks over, you know? Yeah, and yeah. It, yeah, it's basically gonna be, at one point, you're gonna end up with both your editors at parity in terms of feature sets. And then it becomes easy to switch to the other one. That's but great. that process of moving baggage, it has to happen incrementally. Yeah. Yeah, I would like to uh, write actually some JavaScript and get the whole thing ready for, for some web development, if you are for that. Definitely, definitely. definitely. Then we can uh, do this in the, in, in the upcoming week. But man, I copy pasted, I opened a file. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I learned to walk. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool, yeah. Yeah, let, let's go on with this. Um, um, Moody, if someone has uh, Emacs questions for you or something, can mm -hmm. people find you on the internet? Oh, yeah, for sure. Uh, so if you have Emacs or any question really or you want to talk about anything uh 
Uh, you can find me on Twitter. Uh, my username is at uh, Mudit Ameta. That's M-U-D-I-T-A-M-E-T-A. -E on uh, GitHub, I'm uh, Zeusdeud. So that's Z-E-U-S-D-E-U-X. Um, yeah, I think that should be enough, really. Twitter, yeah. I mean, just find me on Twitter. Write me. You'll find me. Yeah. Thread. We talk via Twitter, anyways, right? Yeah, you, you'll nice. find me on uh, Stefan's, uh, like in the thread under Stefan. <laughs> Posting so. gifs. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All the all the silly replies. I'll be there somewhere. Find me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no. Yeah. Then uh, thank you so much. I think that was big, big fun, and I definitely think that we should just um, continue doing this because I want to be a very productive developer here in this fancy nerdy environment. Yeah. Let's give it a shot, man. 2019. Why not try something new? You know. Let's do that. Cool. Yeah. Thank you, Murid. Perfect. Cool. Ciao, bro. Have a good evening. Talk later.